Okay, <clears throat> so welcome everybody to this third Oasis lunchtime talk of the spring season. And uh, for today's presentation, we have here uh, from Obu Academy, Dr. Matilda Stoll. Uh, among other topics, uh, Dr. Stoll's research revolves around players and identity construction, uh, both in online and offline contexts. And, and today she is here to talk about how gaming communities are shaping and are shaped by in-game interaction and identities. And I believe the talk is uh, a bit more discussive. So we will, we'll, instead of having discussion only in the end, we will have uh, brief uh, breaks for intro, uh, discussion uh, in the middle of the talk. Okay. Okay. So take it away, All right. Matilda. Hi, everyone. Is the mic working? Good. So apparently, if you want to talk at any point, if you want to comment or a question or anything like that, just you need the box to be able to talk so the people on the stream can hear you as well. Because, yes, this is the topic uh, of today. Uh, In-game interaction, identities, and communities. Uh, what does it mean to play together? And spoiler alert, I don't actually have an answer to that question, but I do have some thoughts on that and where what it could mean, at least for these people involved in these contexts. And that is kind of what I want to explore here. But I'm going to br I brought a lot of in-game material, like excerpts, empiric material for you, so we can talk through that. And I can show you that, and hopefully there is it will raise some new questions for you too. So we can talk about that. So please just raise your hand and Grab the pink box in case you want to say something. All right, so um, this is me. I defended my thesis in 2021, and I had a really strict opponent. That was Nick Taylor, and he's still around, so I did something right, apparently. Uh, so you can see this is kind of a continuation on what I did for my thesis, but I also uh, kind of tend to broaden. So what I want to do here is show partially what I've done before, but also what I'm working on right now and where I am going next. That is kind of the like, like potential like focus areas going forward. Uh, just to be clear, my back background is in education. I got a bachelor's, master's and doctorate in education. So games, I haven't taken one course credit in games whatsoever, but that has been my focus in terms of research more and more so as I had moved on. And I think the thing I take away with me from like the field of education is working with people, especially young people, because those are the people who are my focus group and the people like how to do research with young people in an ethical way and how to use like that kind of a, like how to do that all in all. So that is what I take with me. And what I do is player-centered research. And I try to, to some extent, like, look at, okay, what are the sort of, like, references? What, where am I coming from? Who am I, whose work am I continuing on? And here are some of them. Uh, of course, game communities, there's great work being done on the, around that before, uh, but also norms, how norms shape games and gamers. I do, to some extent, also use the communities of practice, well, like, framework to kind of understand the learning that happens in games. Uh, of course, other people's work on esports events and communities, because a lot of the work I do focus on multiplayer games. To some extent, also uh, something that I've started to be more and more interested in is uh, like the autoethnographies, researchers doing work on themselves, like using their own gameplay to make sense of the in game, what is happening in games. To some extent, also in game discourse and interaction, Elizabeth Kjorti, for example, who does like these kind of micro analysis of what is happening in games. And I also collaborate a lot with Fredrik Rusk, who is a conversation analysis. I'm not as nitty gritty as he is in, in my analysis, but yes, there is that kind of a micro level into it. And I also do a lot of video ethnographic research, and it, to some extent, that kind of translates into screen recordings in, in game context, but also the, that is the kind of material I work with. But I think this will make a lot more sense in a little while. But I'm actually going to start with some fairly fresh material that I haven't had a chance to really look through yet, shift, shift through. But the first study I'm going to present some examples from is very from, it started in August 2021. Uh, it's uh, an educational project called Tandem Pospel uh, at OAU, and the project leader is Kati Hansal, and there's a group of us working on this. And we did playtests in a laboratory setting, 
and we did them in pairs because like I can happy to tell you more about the educational project if you want to know but in like in a nutshell what we wanted to know in these playtests is that what kind of interaction will be facilitated within the correct age group and they are kids age 9 to 11 or so like what like when they meet and play this game together what kind of interaction will be facilitated then so the analytical focus was on the affordances, the affordances for in-game interaction, if they had these certain tasks. And we chose Minecraft because, partially because when we asked the students involved what game would you think could be potentially have a learning potential in terms of language, uh, they suggested Minecraft, but it has also been employed in various educational studies before, so it's not that groundbreaking because Part of doing these kind of implementations in a school context is always going to be convincing the teacher to do them, and Minecraft is kind of a low, low threshold version to do that. And the playtesters could choose between two different tasks, uh, finding certain animals in survival mode or a joint building project in creative mode. And this is what I'm going to show some examples of next. So the first one is two players, and they are in Minecraft and they are swimming. That is all that is happening essentially in the screen, on the screen. So there is a very kind of, it's, they're also playing on a low difficulty level, so there is not a lot of going on, no danger kind of popping up at this stage. And I think this is the only transcript. So yeah, this is what the material I usually work with look like when we have transcribed it. Um, this is actually the only one that is in Finnish. Uh, player 3 is Finnish speaking and player 4 is uh, bilingual but Finnish is not necessarily his native language, so he's kind of, uh, he's wobbly a little bit in terms of searching for words. Uh, so player three uh, asks, do you often play Minecraft? And then he jumps into the water and is swimming for the rest of this interaction. Player four, uh, yeah, if my little brother, brother plays some things, then I play with him. So there's this discussion. Uh, player three, okay, what is his name? Player four gives the name. There is some silence. They're kind of looking, because they're sitting next to each other, you can, ah, you couldn't see it now, but they're kind of sitting next to each other, so they can look, peer at the other screen. So they're peering, peering, and then uh, player three says, what do you think about Minecraft, or no, no, Fortnite, mm, YouTube, what's been on this season? And then there is some issues with the controller, but he solves the issue himself by kind of like attaching, re like ex uh, removing and reattaching the cord. And then the player four says, that, yeah, there's been some good stuff on Fortnite. I don't really play Minecraft like. And then player three says, me, me either. So there is this, like, there, because of the in-game situation, they're, they're just swimming. They're not doing, there is no kind of threat. Nothing is happening. There is this space for them to just talk. They are talking about games. And we asked about this in the interviews, uh, like, okay, because there is, essentially, it's player three constantly kind of questioning, like, like posing these kind of questions. And I asked like, okay, did you find it uh, awkward when it's completely silent in games? And player three said, it, yeah, it did feel a little weird to be, but mm. And then after a while I asked, okay, is this something you usually do when you play games? And they said, yeah, yeah, all the time. What are we doing? What are we up to? What are we going to do? So there is this kind of assumption that yes, when they are playing together, even as this is a 10 year old, they are communicating, where are we going next? But what we also see when I asked the other, uh, what we asked the other participants is that, okay, how did you feel being the one being posed so many questions, not necessarily engaging in this conversation the same way, but maybe more like being the reciprocant, reciprocant in that sense. And they said like, all right, uh, like, asked about how do you think it worked to talk, that talk at the same time as playing? And the player four said that, all right, you kind of concentrate on both, all right, at the game at the same time as you talk about something. But for him, it was more important the game, as you can see, not necessarily the interaction. The interaction was secondary in that sense. And if you have anything you want to add at any point, just feel free to interrupt me. This is another example from another pair playing the same, uh, doing the same task, but playing on a medium difficulty. So there is a clear different kind of situation because you can see there are zombies attacking them at this point. Player one is saying, uh, I think I'm thinking I will use planks as fuel for the fire here. And there is something that we can't hear. Player two. Uh, yeah, it's the best. And just for context, these none of these people know each other from before. So this is the first time that they are interacting. Uh, play one. 
there is two zombies coming here. Player two, on my way, moves towards the player. Player one, I'm fighting with them. Player two, oh, it's actually three incoming. Hey, can I join in on killing them? Uh, player one, okay. Uh, and then if not four, I need something, uh, some kind of meat, I have no food. The kelp is on the way, but it's not good food. One gets hungry immediately and it only gives half food. And then there's this question, rotten meat will give you hunger. Mm, true, a skeleton, ah, nope. And then he turns around and runs the other way around. And then play one dies. How did that zombie one shot me? Maybe because you had like one heart, if I remember correctly. And then, well, I did get it up to, okay, now I need to find where you are. So you can see that there is a completely different kind of tempo here, that there's kind of like much more rapid dialogue that they need to be, because they're constantly communicating, like in comparison to the first one, they were talking about the game and games in general. Now they actually need to discuss what is happening in game because there's limited time to do anything else. And we also asked them, like, what did you think? Well, it's kind of difficult because they were playing on, diff difficult, on a difficult delay, right? level of difficulty. And they said that, yeah, there were mobs everywhere and we had almost nothing. So right, the in-game was difficult. That was a tricky part. So that also sets, shapes the kind of interaction that happens in-game. My third and final example from this particular material is a different one. They are playing in creative mode, so the difficulty level is rather diff different at this stage. And they have this built, uh, you can see that they're building a house here together. Uh, player five says that this is the last layer. After that, I will start with the ceiling. Falls down, oh no. And then she flies up again and continues working on the wall. Uh, it's good because then it's just to remove stuff if one wants a window somewhere. Hmm. And then I was thinking I could put an edit like on watches the house under construction, maybe something like this or something. Then player says, six says, there's a pig watching me. She, the player five laughs. <laughs> He's like following me. Player five, I know, starts constructing the stairs for the floors upstairs. <laughs> He's actually following me. He is chasing me, the pig giggles. And she giggles and continues building these stairs. Uh, player six, I mean, I think he wants carrots. Do you want carrots? Yeah, he wanted carrots. Are you feeding a pig now too? Hmm, I became friends with him. So here we see a different way of like, there is, yes, they're also negotiating to what is happening in the game, but it's in a different way. It's less hurried, it's more, the, the, the tempo is more relaxed. And when we asked about them, these were actually the only two that knew each other from before. They were friends out of this game context as well. Uh, but this was one of the few moments where they were actually kind of very much interacting with the other. And when we asked about that, because there were long stretches of silence, and this kind of contradicted this hypothesis we had that people who don't know each other will be more silent and people who do know each other will talk more. And that is something we then asked about. Like, okay, so it was kind of silent at times when you played. Does that usually happen when the two of you talk? Yes. So that was nothing weird like that? No. And so it wasn't just because you were here visiting us either? No. So there's kind of stupid researchers shut up about this already. Like, you're, like you, made, you made your point. But yeah, so they were kind of comfortable being silent together. And that was something we had not expected that would happen. That, okay, people who know each other are also comfortable with the silences to a, to a different degree. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, what we've seen so far is that, we've seen it in this material, but also elsewhere, is that game mode, pace, and difficulty creates different affordances for in-game interaction. As we have seen, depending on the difficulty and how what they're working on, there is different opportunities for interaction. And, for example, what that means depends on what kind of context we're coming from, what perspective we're coming from. Frederick Rusk and I come from a more like multiplayer perspective and esports perspective, and then we realize, okay, that high-paced gameplay with high difficulty requires more precise information to coordinate this kind of team play. Like in the zombie situation, they will be needed to be very precise in the information that they're giving. There is no room to talk about pigs. There is no room to talk about YouTube or Fortnite because they need to be on topic. Whereas, for example, if one comes from an educational perspective, then one would think, okay, uh, if we want to facilitate interaction in games. 
what kind of game should we choose for that situation. And I'm thinking the same from game dev as well. Like if we want to facilitate uh, interaction between players, are we actually doing that? And if so, what kind? Because for example, eSport, like if there is a high uh, difficulty, high pace, there's limited opportunities for interaction in that sense. And something I'm curious to find out more about, this is something I don't have an uh, like answer to, is that could eye movements that tracked with eye tracking, could that be some sort of like relevant uh, tools for also understanding exactly where these players' focus is at the time. Anyone wants to comment? Any thoughts? Feel free. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is kind of a question, not a... No, yes, uh, two uh, questions, two-part question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had uh, both... Uh, Finnish speaking and Swedish speaking mm. players, right? Uh, around the same age group still. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did you any notice any kind of differences on on how these two two different language language group, even though they are in the same country, mm. like talked about the game or anything else? Were were there any differences there? Mm. Nice. Uh, yeah, the kind of cultural difference. No, not so far, at least. But then again, that is not something we necessarily have looked at, the kind of attitudes in terms of that. But, I mean, if it could be kind of very stereotypical to kind of understand, like, low-hanging and analy analytical fruit to think that the more talkative one was Swedish-speaking and the more silent one was Finnish-speaking. So that would be kind of like doing it for the easy way around. But I don't think it's that easy. But yes, we, of course. That is the, this is actually the only case because this, this is where we eventually want to lead because that is the pro, like the purpose of the project that one person who speaks one language interacts with another like language speaker and they take turns. So one time they speak Finnish in game and the next time they speak Swedish. But at this stage, we just wanted to see what kind of interaction happens with kids this age. Yeah, thank you. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking about uh, personality types, well, uh, thinking that maybe one should have some quantitative studies that if there are uh, the ga gamers, if they know each other in advance or don't know whether it affects on the level of community. So it's mm. also a question about personality types. Yes, yes. And something I, we didn't include, I didn't include here, is that we actually asked these uh, students, like in advance, like why do you play games? And the most common response was to play with game, to play with friends. But there was also those who wanted to learn things, those who want to kill stuff. I mean, there is all of these. So we, we haven't like organized them into player types, but yes, of course, there's different motivations for doing so. And to some like various degrees, that can be implemented in school because certain games are easier to kind of use in the school context. And like. Yeah, if your motivation for, is to kill stuff, which I, I mean, we all get that, but <laughs> it's still kind of difficult to kind of argue that in terms of like uh, convince a teacher that yes, we want to play this game. But we have actually, I am going ahead of myself, but we have implemented this. And one of the things they have responded uh, with some of the students is like, the best part about this project is that I get to kill stuff in games. So, I mean, <laughs> there is that. And you yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's more common than a question uh, because, first of all, regarding uh, the silence in game between people who knew each other, that what I personally noticed from my playing experience for many, many years, it usually happens with people of different age in different regions because uh, people who know each other usually go to play the game and vice versa people who don't know each other play the game and try to know who they're playing with mm. but sometimes and what probably you noticed and what i wanted to ask uh was there that kind of interaction when uh players wanted to play the game to talk with each other because mm. it sometimes happened uh, in my experience that game became a field and background for some talks and uh, a kind of even mediator to talk with each other between friends or people who just uh, tried to get in together. Mm. Yes, thank you. I think that is like essentially what the point is like, when, we, when we started this project, when, when Katri and I came up with this project was that, okay, like what 
like how to kind of use the like the motivation kids or like people in general but kids in this case have for games so that that could be like the one thing they have something to talk about that because that is something most of them are interested in and that can be the space for because they need to like they are not so focused on playing the game that they might not feel so threatened by the fact that they need to use it in a language and it doesn't feel as scary because they have that game to talk about they have something in common so yes i agree that there is something there thank you oh great I'm just gonna have a sip of water then i also also wonder how the type of the game affects on this because the, I think that I, I have not played Minecraft but mm. I think there is no competition between the gamers mm. so if there is a different kind of game where there is a lot of competition everyone wants everyone wants to win mm. so it could affect yes thank you that was a nice bridge I'm um, actually the, the, the thing I'm going to talk about next is Counter-Strike so yes that is completely different in that sense so thank you for that nice bridge over to the next part but yes uh, because this is clearly collaborative, more like they are collaborating to survive, but in a context where you are competing against each other, then there is going to be different elements. So yes, game modes just shape. Okay, I think I'm going to head on to the Counter-Strike part, unless there was any more questions at this point. There we go. Uh, so this is actually the data collection I did for my thesis back in the day, uh, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, it's an eSports program at a Finnish vocational school. Uh, it's the only Swedish-speaking one, so it, it, you don't have to be very good detectives to find out which one, but I won't be mentioning it as such. Uh, the focus here was on Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and that was not necessarily my choice. It was me approaching these, the school, these participants, and like who wanted to be part of my study, and they all happened to play Counter-Strike. But my initial idea for this, I wanted to understand this kind of committed players, those who are really engaged in games that they even attend an esports program, what does gaming mean to them? So that was kind of like the overall concept to begin with. Um, it's uh, fo seven focused students. They were all aged 16 to 18, identifying as men. Uh, again, not my choice uh, from two different teams, but that was what was available. Uh, the data I have is screen recordings of their computers during the game, so in-game screen recordings, and they did these themselves. So they were the ones to choose what games to share with this researcher and uh, what particular game. The only thing I had certain kind of uh, wishes that they would do it once a month and that there will be wins as well as losses and things like this, but not kind of speci specifying exactly what and when to play. So they submitted seven recorded games per team, and I also did this three to four group interviews with each team. So we have also been talking through this material. And I positioned this as an ethno case study. I tend to include this just in case there's someone who doesn't know what Counter-Strike looks like, but I think this in this crowd, I'm fairly sure you do. But yes, so this is uh, what also what my data looks like. So there is, I have gone through some uh, like things that I've been kind of anonymizing because like I can see, oh, let's see if I, I'm not gonna move that, but you can see like I had to anonymize Steve user, for example. So that is the kind of extent I have been anonymizing this material for the, for the participants' safety and integrity. One of the most common questions I get is, don't they, doesn't this feel intrusive? Because the, I am sitting there listening in a sense because this is a very private conversation these are pe pe people who hang out together and this is a close conversation uh, i think it's discord that they're using to talk to each other and i'm kind of lurking there i'm not physically present there but i am lurking into their conversations mm -hmm. and one of the most common questions is like don't that feel invasive and of course yes to some extent they do i, I am being present there but this uh, example is from one of the teams and the final game that they submitted so they've been doing this they've been meeting up with me regularly at this point and Martin, that is not his real name, is saying, I wonder why he's called back. And he's speaking into the microphone very kind of clearly and making this puffing sound. And, and then he realized I started giggling because he knows what it sounds like when on my computer, when I play this audio. And then he starts giggling like, <clears throat> I'm blowing up the speakers of Matilda's computer. And then, he, then the terrorists swim and Yoni is commenting on something else. And then Martin goes again by saying back. <laughs> And making that so it's kind of teasing me through this material so yes uh, at first it is a bit uncomfortable but after a while they get kind of used to this researcher and can also kind of make fun of her through the material and if anyone is interested the this is the paper where i th discuss this material to so much uh, like i'm basing a lot of the things i'm saying here on this paper so 
feel free to read in case you're interested. But in comparison to the uh, example I just gave you, this is the first game the other team did that they recorded for me. And another team member who is not part of this group, or is part of the group but did not share material with me, but is obviously aware of what we're doing, asks, so are we allowed to swear and say stuff? And Jesper says, well, yeah, you can. She did not say we should, you know, yeah, we can swear absolutely. We did say it didn't make a difference for her. And then Emil questions, what kind of difference would that be for her? Jesper, you don't have to say all fucking, you know, useless shit. Emil, you keep it to a minimum. <laughs> yes, but right. And then Emil reminds them, it starts in 10 seconds, by the way. Uh, Sebastian, they don't add everything. Emil, no, no, I'm recording, by the way. And Sebastian, but highlights. So I think like there's two discussions going on here. One of them is very much a methodological one. Like, what did it mean to be part of this research? Like, okay, who is this research? Who is this her researcher that is going to be lurking on us? And what can we do? And what can't we do when she's around? And like, okay, they are not going to add everything. He, they quite right. I am not going to add everything. I'm using highlights or excerpts. So they're kind of like negotiating their understanding of this material. But there's also uh, this discussion about what kind of language to use. Are they going to swear or not when they are recording this? And, the, and there's this underlying assumption that they usually swear. They usually use a certain kind of language. And will they be using that here? So what I did is that I talked to them and said that, yeah, this will be used for research. You know that. But if you feel comfortable swearing in front of me, then that is kind of fine with me. That, that you don't have to censor yourself for me. But just be aware that this will be recorded. Any comments or thoughts at this stage before I move on? So at least I have the question that I'm wondering in a, in a research setting like this, how much would they start sort of acting up because of the researcher, like, mm. like kind of like, well, you know, she's saying it's okay to swear and now because of this, I feel like swearing a lot more than even mm -hmm. normally, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. That is, of course, always uh, like one possibility. And I think like people adapting their behavior will, of course, be part of this kind of research and in any capacity. And that's like what we I've also been part of doing this with video ethnography in schools where we look at like follow students throughout the day. And of course, to some extent, they do change the, their behavior and kind of feel very aware of it. But after a while, it grows boring because you can't keep up with something like that long. So then it's just like, okay, I'm just going to be kind of relax into this and do not do more or less. But of course, but yes, of course, there is that like performative aspect to it to some extent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, did they probably mention at some point, not like directly, but uh, through some words was it because you were a researcher you were an adult or you were doing research and recording that for research because i know that sometimes even uh, not young people but adults are not comfortable with swearing with rude language when they are a part of research or mm -hmm. talk with researchers mm -hmm. and vice versa with it when it's uh, an adult who is familiar to young people they are okay with swearing at least that what i got from teaching experience experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that in, for me, it was like the researcher role, I could kind of hide behind that and be like, okay, anything goes. But uh, the educator roles, then it's, it's going to be like, oh, I shouldn't really be allowing this. But okay, sure. Like I am not here as an educator right now. I'm here as a researcher. So yeah, that's kind of tend to, but we, we kind of negotiated around that in a sense. But yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Okay. I have Lots of more examples for you, but please feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have thoughts and comments. And, and again, we will we will be perhaps going till the twelve o'clock, uh, one o'clock, with this kind of uh, rhythm. Yeah. So so presentation talk, presentation mm. talk. Yeah. I will think maybe save five minutes in case there's any kind of general discussion you want to have. But yeah, that seems good. Uh, okay. So this very much uh, aligns with previous research that there is uh, this offensive language is considered player jargon. It's very common in games. And it's even, Emma Vossen has noted that it's even considered a game within the game. Like who can be 
use the most, like the worst kind of language. And I think like the example we saw a little while ago, it's kind of fairly harmless. It's kind of swear words. But I think that when it becomes problematic is when this offensive language is someone's identity is used in some way to as uh, like a negative remark. And I have some examples of that as well when things become uh, a bit more problematic. So just so you know, offensive language ahead is going to come. This is one example of that. Uh, when it's uh, italic, it's going to be, that means that it's uh, written in the text. Like, it, no written in the text chat. So opponent says, uh, fucking nose, or types, fucking no scope, get fucked. And John does what they do quite a lot. They, he reads this out loud because there is not always that uh, opportunity for, like, if you're in-game, you don't always have time to actually read what is written in the chat. So he is, like, reading out loud. Uh, fucking no scope, get fucked. And then he stops because he has noticed that uh, the opponent on line three has said you and word. And there is this silence and there is this instant reaction almost at the same time by all players. John says, wow, this is an educational video, you fuck. Martin types report. William, who is that? And then Aster addresses this person. Why so racist? So there is a lot of things happening in this one short, short moment. But something we found, uh, we didn't notice this the first time around when we analyzed this material, but one minute later, this opponent actually gets back to this and writes types in the chat, uh, sorry, I was hyped. And this results in this discussion of like, is that a legitimate excuse? And they are not, they are agreeing that it isn't. So, but this is kind of like an interesting case of seeing what, okay, what kind of language is okay. And all of these players, like in this team, clearly uh, orient towards this language use as not okay. Like this person has overstepped at this stage. Thoughts? Comments? Oh, plenty. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I can't remember. I'm, I'm thinking about the first text yeah. thing. So did they censor that themselves? Yes. So they censored that, but not the latter. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah that's... Yeah. Uh, Strong choice, yes, let's say that. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, this is ex exactly as it was written. Yes. Go so ahead. I've got I've got uh, an empirical question and then a question about um, I guess non-empirical. Hmm. Um, was this before or after PewDiePie did that similar speech act? Like I'm, <gasps> I'm curious how this is amplified or condoned by I big influencers. When was that? Uh, do you have the date for it? Google says 2017. So I'm not sure. That is actually a good question because you're not the first to actually point out that there is similarities to, between that case and what they did here. I, I do not know, but mm. it's a good question to see, like, is this something that is a rhetoric that is kind of used and reused or was it just a coincidence? But yeah, I don't right. know. Mm. Right. Um, and then the second question, if I can ask it, yeah. if that's okay, is um, so they're, they're kind of, like you mentioned the kind of, prospect that they might be kind of performing mm. right for for the presence of a researcher mm. i was wondering if here or later on you could kind of speak to you know as someone who is a competent gamer mm. and uh uh you know uh, presents as a cisgendered woman mm. and uh is also an educator where and how were you kind of like like how did you articulate or think about or perform your role in this research and could could they have been kind of correcting each other mm. and other players because they wanted to, you know, impress teacher yep. or, you know, something yep, like yep, that. Yep, that's a good question. I think that there was one clear instance of that, at least when they were kind of reading me through the gendered lens in that yeah. sense. That now they're talking to women because I was asking about, we were talking about these kind of situations during an interview and I asked, like, how do you feel about uh, women in games? And there was this shuffling about what do we say to this woman? What can we say? And then I pointed out that, okay, yes, it's a different thing. Like what you personally think and what the game community looks like can be two separate things. And I get that. So that kind of like opened their eyes. Okay, okay, we can talk about this. And there was these kind of discussions about, okay, how are women perceived in these games? And one of them said like, yeah, yeah, this shouldn't matter if you're a girl and things like that. But uh, what I found interesting is that there is, uh, so this is the only kind of clearly racist remark in this material, and they are kind of instantly commenting on that. However, there is homophobic language use, there is misogynist, misogynistic, is that how you say it? 
yeah, misogynistic language used as well in this material, and they, there is not this reaction to this. They are kind of, that is kind of, that is, not all of them use that, but still that is, there is not that much, it isn't questioned to the same extent. And I think that is something that opened my eyes to this material is, okay, like people are not brands. We don't have like this, like, like, like an idea of, okay, these are our values, but we can be kind of shifty. We can like think that racism isn't okay, but we can still use homophobic language use. And that is what's gonna happen here. So maybe have an awareness of that, that people are not maybe as like, they haven't necessarily always been that reflexive about their values, and that can be seen in their in the in-game interaction. So thank you for that question. Yeah, go ahead. Probably a little remark uh, regarding what you said about homophobic language, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, from also my experience of uh, people I was playing with, uh, it's sometimes uh, in some game communities it's perceived. Uh, even okay, like as eleven of players jargon, even when the those communities are not homophobic. Mm. So probably it also matters. I don't know if it matters with the construct culture strike because I don't know many people playing it, but in some communities it still works. So, and it's something like what also interested me in interplay inter interaction, like how community can be at the same time allies to LGBT plus people, but mm. still use homophobic language as mm. normatized jargon. Mm. Yes, exactly. And I think that is a good point to kind of remember here that they are not, like, apart from those that are, like, uh, cursive, those are clearly addressed elsewhere. But this is kind of in-game, like, is in-group in and like a group of friends. So they might be using certain language that they think, like, okay, this is okay here, this does not reflect my values, but this is the way we talk. Which can be, of course, very problematic, but uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like I stepped into their, like, bedroom, in a sense, and had access to that like very kind of limited because of course I will be speaking differently here than I will be at my in my home and that is going to shift. So yeah, that is a good question. But um, yes, thank you. Anything else at this point? Okay, I have another example that is on similar topic because it's more it's game specific in that sense. Uh, Martin says uh, he gets killed by an opponent wielding a P90. And for, if anyone is not familiar with a P90, that is uh, a very kind of easy gun, perceived as an easy gun to use, an easy weapon to use. So, and then he says, oh, P90, get a life. And Yon la laughs at that. And Yoni says, well, buy a 90 yourself and own him. And Martin says, then he writes, types in the chat, get a life, P90 noob. And there's a flashbang, please. And then John says, toxic. So this is kind of different because this is within the team. This is your friend. Like, and Martin is having this rant. He's the only one really engaging with this. He is so frustrated with this person who he perceives ta is taking the easy route. It's not technically cheating, but he, like in his normative idea of how this game should be played, you do not use the P90 because that is wrong. And then he gets so frustrated by getting killed by one of those. And Yoni suggests that you could you could use it yourself and then own him, like get back to this person. But he doesn't feel like that is a valid point. And then John kind of questions this, uh, like kind of because he's clearly not focusing on playing the game right now. He's just focusing on his frustration towards this player. And something we found interesting here is that this, because this is in-game, it's different to kind of comment this to someone who you will never play against again, who you don't know who they are. If we saw the opponent, they were kind of very harsh and very direct in their like feedback towards this person. However, when you do that to someone you were friends with in school and in game, it, you need to kind of address it differently. So that also says something about in-game interaction and how, like, if you want to question this kind of language use, how do you go about that in your own team? Okay. So something, uh, so yes, I'm interested in this, how this shapes in-game communities and beyond, but I'm not really sure how to research that because it's a tricky one, because it's difficult to how do you see how this kind of moves, because here we can see it both in-game and in the voice chat, but I'm sure it's gonna be on Reddit, like uh, Melania and I look at, like on Reddit, it's gonna be on Discord, it's gonna spread, but it, this is not just a one in-game phenomena, it moves between different platforms and how to do ethnographic research in my case on this, I'm not quite sure, but it's something I would very much like explore in the future just to see how these things kind of move and shift and shape each other. Thoughts or questions at this point? Just lifting your hand. 
Go ahead. <laughs> Let me have a look. Okay, we're good on time. Yeah, I did kind of touch upon this before, but there is a high, in this material, there's a high focus on this perceived player competence and normative play, that, like I just showed, that there's this idea of how to play these games and who is a skilled player and who isn't. And the, for, for the last examples I have for you is how certain tools from the game is kind of used by the players to create uh, this idea of who is skilled and who isn't, who has uh, knowledge in game and who hasn't. For example, Martin here, um, he is considered the, the best player within this group. He's the leader, he's the most skilled one because he's the highest ranked. And he has also put the most hours. So what he says here is that, I mean these, yeah, you can tell things are going to shit for me. When are you got? <clears throat> I got four kills. And he's really frustrated at this point because he doesn't want to point out that his cope, like his team members are performing better than him and they are technically like worse than him in his mind. And then William says, yeah, the highest rank is in the bottom. What kind of joke is this? And then Martin reiterates it, <clears throat> highest rank in the bottom. Mm. And then William says, this is because we are losing. If this was a winning game, you would be all over somewhere. So what we see here is that they are very aware that Martin is, has the highest rank. So they, this kind of instrument that comes from the game, they become part of the gameplay, they become part of the game community and part of the team and how they perceive themselves and their co-players. Let's see. Um, another, not, this is not rank, but this is about stats and how they are also used in a way to create this idea of who is a good or bad, good or bad player in that sense. This is from the other team. They are spectating a random co-player and the bomb has been planted. Yes, says he can't win this anymore. And then the uh, random player kills an opponent. Sebastian says he's 19 and five in stats. The player, uh, random player says, shoots the remaining opponent. Jesper, what the fuck? Emma says, nice. And Jesper, oh my God, it not, I did not think you could win that in any way. 20 and 5, what the fuck, he's entirely HC, hardcore, that is. And then he defuses the bomb and wins the round. And what we see here is that there is no, like he's, they are reiterating, like these, his stats. Uh, it's 19 and 5, 20 and 5. Everybody knows what these stats are. It's kills and deaths. And this, there's no kind of like, okay, what are you talking about here? These are the stats that matter. Assist doesn't matter, apparently, because they are not even mentioned. But kills and deaths is what matters. And through his stats, what presumed he, a presumed person, uh, a man person, uh, is um, perceived as good based on these stats. Thoughts or questions, comments at this point? No? All right. So my final uh, example on this, how these kind of in-game tools shape who we see as good or that's good. Uh, as the first team where they are talking about the AVP, that is the sniper rifle. And Martin says, why don't I hit anything? I'm not using the AVP anymore. Johnny says, me neither. And John, me neither. Uh, and Johnny says again, Aster is the only one to allow to have it. The Aster says, the AVP or Johnny, you were the last to hit your target. Martin, I usually play well with the AVP. What the fuck is this shit? Johnny, well, usually, but not now. He also missed. And then asked that, I usually miss the easy shots and then hit the, hit the difficult ones. And what we can see here is this, this one particular weapon and they are discussing who is good at this, who is not good at this. And like so far, Martin first like kind of makes this exclamation that ah, I can't use this anymore. But then when his teammates kind of agree that yes, you shouldn't be allowed to wear that, or use that right now, then he's kind of get defensive because he usually plays well with AVP. He is considered the, the best player within the group. So there is this kind of shift going around, like this negotiation of who is allowed to have the AVP. And the AVP is considered, it is a high status weapon in that sense. So who is allowed to have that has a certain status within the group as well. All right. So something I'm really interested in to look at is how does this idea of real gamers, like real games, real gamers and real gameplay, how does that shape both grassroots but, and professional play? And who feels included and who feels excluded by these kind of structures? And I'm working together with Nick on doing that in terms of professional play. So looking forward to 
we're doing esports, uh, interview with esports people there. So we will probably get some more uh, answers to these questions later on. But this is something I'm really interested in, like how does this shape both grassroots, you can here you've seen some examples of grassroots play, but also professional ones at that. Okay, uh, I'm just going to do this quick, uh, I don't know, commercial advert. Uh, me and Fredrik Krusk are going to talk about what it means to play together from an autoethnographic uh, work. And we got our uh, abstract got accepted for the spring seminar, really looking for the, for the party party. And uh, there, we're, what we're looking at, we're playing, uh, there is this quest called the fraternity party, but we are also a party of two. So then we are uh, examining through our own gameplay, what does it mean to play together? And some of the things we've seen uh, so far is that playing together requires organizing time for play. And that is something we did not think about prior to this like, experiment, because like, oh, like how much time people actually, have to be able to play, you need to create time for that. And that is something that is kind of taken for granted in a lot of ways. And that's something I would like to uh, research even more going forward. Like how does people facilitate time to, for playing? Especially when you have different hobbies and families and life happening around you. How do you organize and facilitate that play? But also what does it mean to have a partially shape, shape, shared in-game experience? Because yes, it is, we're doing the same quest, but we are still viewing it from completely different angles. We are sitting in different spaces. We do not see each other. So what does that mean? But yeah, we're going to explore that further in the, during the spring seminar. Thank you. Do you have any questions on a more broad, or thoughts on a more broad scale? Go ahead. Hello. Sorry. I'm still oh, capturing this whole thing. Uh, actually, I was thinking about the previous uh, part uh, with, uh, with Martin. And and kind of uh, did you see any correlation between kind of this thing that uh, a player uh, their perceived goodness at the game? Like you said that everybody thought that Martin was the yeah. the best player, and at least in the example, he was the one that got uh, the most easily frustrated mm -hmm. when they were not kind of. Uh, performing to the level of all, what their expectations was. Mm. So was there this sort of thing that the, the so-called best players actually got more, well, they said toxic, but kind of more fr frustrated, more mm. vocal when they weren't kind of uh, performing as well as like everybody expected them to? Mm. Where, where's this sort of expectations versus on, on how easily they got kind of frustrated and and started lashing out or that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, that is an interesting question. I haven't like looked at it as through that lens particularly, but I think it's connected to the competitiveness because they are competitive to various degrees. And for example, Jon, that I haven't been talking that much about, for him, he is mainly interested in this playing Counter-Strike. His main interest is his skins. He's really interested yeah. in weapon skins and trading those. And that is kind of his way to work around this. So what happens in game is just partially relevant. And he does not either tend to be the, necessarily the one that is most verbal or most frustrated as such. But I think it's connected to how uh, competitive you are and how serious you take these games and how, like, because then it gets really kind of personal and important when you lose or when someone is not up to par, so to say, yeah. Yeah, thanks for interesting talk. Uh, uh, one thing that I uh, was thinking about is the uh, sort of uh, community and, and uh, collaboration, com uh, communication dimensions that are related to uh, sort of off offline, online dimensions. Uh, can you uh, talk a bit more how much of your research is uh, like co-located, uh, uh, collaborative or, or competitive play, and how do you see the phenomena of community formation as a phenomenon also from methodological perspective being different when you are studying something that is mm, like in MMORPGs, for example, uh, mostly completely offline mm. community formation or communication as contrasted to this kind of co-located phenomenon. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah, so, uh, thank you for that question. I think that is something I was kind of going into this. I was like, oh, all I want to see is what's happening on the screen. Like, I, like I've been doing ethnography in schools before. I, I know what's going on there. I don't need to do that again. I'm just going to focus on what happens on the screen. Uh, but afterwards, that is something we have been thinking about, analysis material. It would be so nice to know what is happening around them 
and like how that has shaped because of course these people know each other from an offline context they go to school together so that will of course shape how they perceive each other how they orient towards each other and then there is the whole school context and teachers and things shaping their particular community but methodologically that is something i would very much want to see how that physical place where you are playing uh how that shapes your like your experience of the game so to speak and i think that is one thing we're trying to poke at a little bit with using ourselves as data because then we can kind of see like what questions would be relevant to ask because it can be seen as very intrusive if we if apart from the fact that we want to see what you're doing in game we want to hear what you're talking about now we also want to see you and we want to see what's happening in your home so and i think everyone knows that it's maybe not i mean I, at least me i am not like having my most like sitting with the best posture playing video games. I look all kinds of weird when I play video games. So like, do you really want to share that with someone outside? So I think that is why we need to look at ourselves first to see what would be relevant, what kind of data would we want out from that? And then ask some participants if we could have access to that. But I hope I answered your question. Thank you. There was a uh, question online. Uh, so this is actually regarding the upcoming study. Mm. And uh, are you planning to compare organizing time for play across age groups and family situations? Mm. Yes, that is definitely something I found interesting. Uh, we have we don't have a clear plan, but yes, I think that is a relevant question. Because, for example, me and Frederick, we have noticed that he, him as a father of two, he has much more limited time to actually play games and we are very much shaped by his, uh, like the, the spaces that creates for uh, time and play. But whereas I, who live just two adults who are both gamers, there is plenty of time reserved for games. So that is not much as much of an issue. So yes, this will of course uh, affect. And if it's kids, then there's going to be parents who dictate that. But yes, thank you for whoever posed that question. I started to wonder the possibilities for the game development because, uh, for example, we in my family we like to play Carcassonne because mm. there you are supposed to negotiate, you su are supposed to show what card you pick, and mm. the, everyone is supposed to start saying put it there or put it there, and this this is the best place mm. for me or someone else. Mm. So we could kind of start to develop games where you supposed to have discussions mm. true true and i think to some extent like what we see here in the competitive like now i ma mainly pointed out when like there is this kind of problematic or like interesting nuggets of something is happening like the, when they're questioning like uh, skills or this offensive language but we what we also look at is what happens how what kind of what way do you communicate when things work out and like how, like what kind of calls are you making for like communication to actually flow to the things to work? And what we see is, uh, is, for example, that you need to give information, but you also need to give correct information in game, in the Counter-Strike that is, but you also need to give uh, at the right time. You can't be like late, but you're also super, like if you, like silence is equally bad because like you need to say something. So it's kind of like, but still at the same time, we don't have any situation where there is someone says that that is irrelevant information. So there is this, like, desire, uh, there is this need for information all of the time. But they, it's not necessarily. I mean, it's mostly just calls, one words, two words at that. But it's definitely a form of communication and collaboration in a very fast-paced game. But yes, very com different comparison to Carcassonne, though. But the, the the pace is kind of like shaping the communication that happens there. Comments? No, no, just waving. <laughs> no. <laughs> you have so distinct arm movements, apparently. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I I think it looks like we we don't have any more questions, and 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 maybe maybe more questions are brewing slowly. Uh, but but for now, we we might as well wrap up the talk and let's give a last uh, round of big applause to Dr. Stoll. Thank you. And thank you.